So we'd like to welcome you out to this Federal Society event. Uh, I'm sure most of you have been to a Federal Society event before, but just in case this is your first time, the Federal Society is a conservative and libertarian and nonpartisan organization that uh, believes in the principles of federalism, limited government, judicial restraint, and freedom. Um, and we like debates, and so we're glad that we have one today. Uh, our speakers, our participants. Uh, so on my far left, uh, we have uh, Mr. Ilya Shapiro. He is from uh, the Cato Institute, uh, where he is senior fellow there in constitutional studies, as well as the editor-in-chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review, a nice publication to get in if you can. Um, before joining Cato, Mr. Shapiro was uh, a special assistant slash advisor for the multinational force in Iraq on rule of law issues, um, and he has practiced privately in uh, international political, commercial, and antitrust litigation. Um, been in various journals and also um, has also written a lot for a more, I guess, what we call the popular media and has also appeared on numerous TV shows, in, including uh, The Colbert Report. Um, he uh, got his JD from the University of Chicago uh, and uh, also holds a master's uh, degree from London School of Economics and clerked on the Fifth Circuit. Um, our other participant will be uh, Professor Fred Smith. Uh, Professor Smith uh, uh, received his JD from Stanford Law School. Uh, he clerked on the uh, Second uh, Circuit, U.S. Court of Appeals, uh, in Manhattan, and also clerked in the uh, Middle District of Alabama in Montgomery. Uh, he also worked uh, in a, uh, says a lit litigation boutique, so that's a smaller uh, firm, right, uh, in Atlanta, and is a uh, and was a former uh, member of the Georgia Bar. Uh, he's I also had uh, some publications, and let's see, one, uh, he was a finalist in the American Constitution Society's National Moot Court Competition. Uh, so we're pleased to have both of them today. Uh, the, the format's going to go like this. They'll have 15 to 20 minutes to make opening remarks. Uh, then they'll have five minutes of rebuttal, and then we'll open it up to the audience for, for Q&A. So, Mr. Shapiro. Well, thanks very much for having me. Um, I think I've spoken at, uh, do you call it Bolt anymore? I know there's this whole rebranding thing at Berkeley Law, whatever. Anyway, I've, I've been here uh, a couple of times. Um, you know, I understand now uh, that you'd like to have your speakers come with, uh, you know, orange jumpsuited protesters and so forth. I apologize that I wasn't able to bring any of those. Um, you know, uh, one thing that, uh, that James mentioned was that the Federal Society is for judicial restraint. Uh, I'm not sure that's the official p policy of the Federal Society because, you know, you hear these terms, uh, restraint or activism or neutrality, judicial minimalism, you know, certainly don't want them to have political bias. Um, but, but what does it mean? Quite often, you know, activist is synonymous with uh, any decision the speaker doesn't like. And restraint means, oh, the judge is being wise and, you know, oh, I agree with that decision, you know, coincidentally. Um, so I want to make for you uh, the case for an active rather than an activist judiciary. And indeed, uh, to the extent uh, my the theory of constitutional interpretation or, or judicial action, uh, you want to call it activist, well, uh, you know, that's fine. That's just semantics and I'll... I'll posit that judicial activism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Depending on where you stand on the political spectrum, <coughs> you might be angry about unelected liberal judges rewriting the Constitution to reflect their own ill-conceived policy notions. Or you might be outraged that reactionary conservative judges are striking down laws and threatening all the progress that we've made on civil rights and civil liberties. Either way, you're likely to view the actions of these dangerous black-robed arbiters as judicial activism uh, that must be stopped at all costs. But again, what is this judicial activism? Uh, if it's merely an invalidation of government action, uh, as my former professor Cass Sunstein, now the regulatory czar, has proposed, he wrote this big kind of empirical study um, you know, try to have an, a neutral definition of, of activism and trying to figure out which judges are activists. And he said, okay, any time any uh, legislation is struck down or federal agency action is overturned, we'll call that activist. Just kind of a neutral definition. Um, 
you know, there's certain problems with that. So for, because, for example, if, uh, you know, an agency is you know, you know, promoting uh, liberal regulations, then striking it down might be conservative activism or it might not, or, you know, if it's, or, or vice versa. I mean, it, it, it depends how, uh, you know, the, the, the the nub of the matter of what exactly is being uh, acted upon. If it's, if, you know, if, if it's a legislature acting that's Republican majority and it's being struck down, is that liberal activism? If it's, you know, being allowed to, uh, I mean, you get the idea. There, there are some, there are some methodological problems with that kind of method. But if that's, if we accept that, that kind of uh, neutral definition, striking down government action, uh, then what are the beloved liberal troika of uh, Miranda, Brown, and Roe, but um, unabashed activism? Right? Each of those uh, struck down government action. Conversely, if President Bush is correct that activism is disrespecting federalism and acting, quote, without regard for the will of the people and their elected representatives, then what would be more activist than the Bush Justice Department's opposition to California's medicinal marijuana or Oregon's right to die statute? You know, firm positions by the Bush DOJ. Um, Examples like this abound. I mean, judicial activism is everybody's favorite bogeyman, and uh, neither the left nor the right can provide a coherent definition beyond uh, Justice Potter Stewart's famous dictum, which was issued in the context of obscenity, but really, uh, as Sandra Day O'Connor proved, that could be extended to an entire non-philosophy of jurisprudence. Uh, I'll know it when I see it, Right. Uh, most people who use the term uh, don't have a coherent definition. It typically, again, means just a judicial opinion with which I disagree. Uh, so you have, for example, Cass Sunstein, who thinks that you know there's conservative judges who are striking down agency actions that are that are activists. Um, on the other hand, you have Robert Bork, right, the uh, the failed Supreme Court nominee and former Solicitor General and you know, legal scholar, uh, who thinks that any uh, any uh, judicial Opinion that that defends or upholds an unenumerated right is is activist. So anything that's not specifically listed in the Bill of Rights, uh, if a judge says there's a right to that, well, that that's activist. And you know the Ninth Circuit, uh, the Ninth uh, 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 Amendment is an ink blot essentially uh, because we don't know what it means and therefore it means nothing. Um, you know those are kind of the, the extremes, right? But I think there's a third way. Uh, the purveyors of conventional punditry all miss the larger point. The role of the judiciary, in terms of constitutional interpretation, is to faithfully interpret and apply the Constitution, period. So um, if if that means upholding a law, fine. If that means striking it down, fine. Um, Activism is, is kind of doing something that's not supposed to be the judicial role or not being faithful to the Constitution which is no small task, in part because of the doctrinal mess that the Supreme Court has made. Um, you know, again, whether a, a particular statute stands or falls uh, is, is of no moment. Fidelity to the founding document should be a, the touchstone, not a circular debate over the virtues of uh, judicial restraint, or as uh, John Roberts put it at his confirmation hearings, modesty, right? Just calling balls and strikes, just you know, being kind of a modest judicial role. You know, again, it's that, that, again, where you stand on those sorts of debates depends on, on where you sit. Um, as long as we accept that judicial review is constitutional and appropriate in the first place, you know, Marbury versus Madison, and how a judiciary is supposed to execute its role um, and ensure that government stays within its um, limited powers without the power of judicial review is, is beyond me, then we should only be concerned that a court gets it right regardless of whether the correct interpretation leads to a challenge law being upheld, overturned, you know, the lower court being affirmed, reversed, what have you. For that matter, an honest court watcher shouldn't care whether one party wins or loses. To, again, paraphrase uh, then-Judge Roberts at his confirmation hearing, uh, the little guy should win when he's in the right, and the big guy should win when he's in the right. The framers' constitutional understanding uh, Federalist Paper 78 to 83, for example, are uh, the primary ones which discuss the judicial role, provide the boundaries between proper and improper judicial activism. And so, uh, to paraphrase those understandings, uh, there's a few rules that I would apply about what courts should do. So first, uh, review all state action, government action, that implicates liberty, 
then apply not a presumption of constitutionality, which is essentially what rational basis review is, you know, Congress, everything it does, we presume it's constitutional, but of liberty, because after all, the, the Constitution is there uh, to, to promote freedom and liberty, and uh, like Federalist 51, which is my feder favorite Federalist paper, indeed my vanity plate on my car says Fed 51, right? If, if men were angels, well, you know, we wouldn't need government. If angels govern men, well, no problem. Angels are doing everything fine. But uh, in a world where men govern men, we first have to empower the government to do certain things, preserve the rule of law, rules of the game, that sort of thing, and then check that government, right? Um, well, how do we do that? We don't do it by presuming that everything the government does is okay. We do it by saying, asking the question, does this promote liberty? And then void any exertion of power that's not expressly enumerated, because by definition, any exertion of power uh, somehow infringes liberty. Now, somehow, sometimes you, uh, you know, that's a good thing, because, you know, when we criminalize something, that infringes on the criminal's liberty. But that's good, because, uh, you know, he's detracting from the liberty of others, and we kind of have this sort of calculus, the basis of the criminal law. Give meaning to every word in the Constitution. Uh, you know, there are no ink blots or technicalities or outmoded, antiquated portions. Uh, and only exercise judicial rather than legislative or executive power. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, micromanaging war, for example, is, seems to be, however you draw that line, would be getting into the executive power. Or, uh, you know, there, there's less so now, but in the 60s and 70s, uh, courts would require legislatures to pass budgets for their school systems or, or what have you, kind of micromanaging the legislative process. But why go through all this tedious uh, process anyway, you know, trying to be faithful to the Constitution, to the founding text, rather than just having a, a living Constitution or some other method of interpretation? Uh, well, the, I mean, the principal benefit of a written Constitution is that it subjects judges, legislatures, and executive officials to rules and principles that can't be literally changed by those same government officials. Uh, to be sure, judges of goodwill will and can read the same words and history and come up with different outcomes. Look at District of Columbia versus Heller, the big Second Amendment case. Uh, right? Everybody, you know, Scalia's majority opinion, Stevens' dissent, everybody purported to be doing an originalist analysis of what the right to keep and bear arms meant uh, at the time of the ratification of the Second Amendment. And they came up with, uh, with differing interpretations. That's okay. They were both engaged in, in good faith uh, uh, judging, I would say. But it's impossible to conceive of a process that would produce more consistent results uh, or that would vest the judiciary with the credibility it needs to function if we're simply saying, okay, judges, just, you know, we're putting you up there because you're wise, you know, use your wisdom, purely, you know, just, just use, your, use your judgment. Uh, that's what you're supposed to do. If we value the rule of law, there is simply no substitute for a good faith effort to apply the meaning of the Constitution, especially in light of changing circumstances and exigencies. Um, you know, just because we now have the Internet doesn't mean we don't understand what the Commerce Clause means. Um, just because we now have uh, you know, uh, stagecoaches rather than horseback or uh, you know, horseless carriages after that. doesn't mean each time some bit of the Constitution gets outmoded. Uh, just because we now have 300 million people instead of 20 million. Um, you know, the, the, the best founding documents are the ones that are simplest. You know, look at the, the Brazilian Constitution, something like 300 pages and you know, guarantees all sorts of different things. But I, I don't think the rule of law is stronger in Brazil than uh, in, you know, uh, countries that have shorter constitutions. The dividing line, then, is not between judicial activism or abdication, uh, which is equally a type of activism, like, for example, Kelo versus New London, right, where the court let the legislature go through with its taking, which I would argue is, um, you know, violated all sorts of rights. Uh, but the judiciary abdicated its role, I'd say, by, by being restrained. Um, so between activism and restraint, it's rather between legitimate and vigorous judicial action and illegitimate judicial imperialism, right? Thinking that, you know, I'm the judge, uh, I know better. Um, for proof of this observation's legitimacy, look no further than the contrast between the public sentiment 
towards the very different activisms, or at least what people have called activisms, of the Warren and Rehnquist courts, respectively. You know, the Warren court um, uh, you know, expanded uh, rights of criminals, found rights to privacy, all, all these different things. Um, uh, sometimes uh, ended up being good policy, but some of the law is kind of wishy-washy. Uh, the Rehnquist court had a, a short-lived uh, federalism revolution, or as I like to put it, uh, armed insurrection. It didn't really uh, go very far. Uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, a lot of opinions were, at least by liberal commentators, labeled as, as activist. Um, and the, the public seems to have, um, you know, by even now saying the court is, is too liberal, um, seems to have reconciled itself to the Rehnquist court and seen that as, more, as less activist than the Warren court. Now, ultimately, judicial power isn't a means to an end, be that end uh, liberal, conservative, libertarian, what have you, but instead an enforcement mechanism for the strictures of a founding document. To that end, uh, as it were, certain judicial decisions will produce unpopular outcomes. But the solution to that in a republic with a founding document intended just as much to curtail democratic excesses as to empower uh, democracy. Um, in, in such a country, the proper response is to change the law. If we're governed by law and not men, and you don't like what decision the judges have made based on interpreting that law, then you know, pass a new law. Or if in the case of a constitutional uh, decision, uh, amend the Constitution. And now, you know, people say, oh, but it's too hard to amend the Constitution. That, that's because of the, the various constitutional perversions we've had going back to the New Deal and Progressive Era. If the decision was made to enact all sorts of facially unconstitutional uh, legislation in the first place and just have uh, courts go along with it, then obviously it becomes harder to pass actual constitutional amendments. Because look how we've effectively amended the Constitution without uh, literally amending it. Any other method than this changing of the law when you don't like the legal result or changing the Constitution when you don't like the constitutional result um, leads to a sort of judicial abdication and the loss of those very rights and liberties that can only be vindicated through, through the judicial process. So think about, for example, the Lily Ledbetter case, right? Um, this is a, a few years ago. A, a woman had a, a lawsuit in, the, in suing Goodyear. Uh, for uh, sex discrimination in employment. Her, she was being paid less over many, many years uh, than men in her position. Uh, the, got up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that in their interpretation of the statute at issue, um, the statute of limitation had run. So not that you know, she didn't have a case or she wasn't discriminated against, but the you know, statute of limitations had run. Um, uh, there, there, this became a huge political issue. Uh, it became an issue in the 2008 election, and lo and behold, the first uh, uh, law that President Obama signed was the Lilly Ledbetter uh, Fairness in Employment or, or Pay Discrimination Act or whatever the technical term is, which now you could argue over the, you know, the policy of it, but it changed the statute of limitations. I mean, what it actually did was say that every time you got a new paycheck, a new statute of, limit, uh, statute of limitations would start running. Um, you know, there were alternatives that were proposed, but that, you know, that's the one that went out. But that's a, that's a great result uh, in terms of how our system is supposed to work. You don't like the Supreme Court's interpretation, change the law. Okay. Um, you know, otherwise, you, you simply have uh, judges who are exercising uh, judicial power divorced uh, from any authority given to them by the Constitution, and they're no better than... Uh, you know, uh, uh, an executive tyrant or a, an out-of-control legislature or, or anything else. I mean, um, uh, you know, any other method leads to kind of uh, government or judging by, by pure force of will rather than by the consent of the governed or implied consent or protection for minority rights or whatever your theory is of where government gets its legitimacy to act. Or it leads to government by uh, black-robed philosopher kings. And as, Je as Justice Scalia is fond of saying, even if we wanted that kind of rule, why in the world would we pick nine lawyers for that job? Um, there's a better way, whether we call it activism or, say, the proper role of an Article III judge. Thanks.
thank you for that, and thank you to the Federal Society for this invitation. Um, I think in light of those remarks, this really isn't a debate necessarily about judicial activism, right? I'm not about to get up here and defend uh, or, you know, or take the position that we should never, uh, that the judges should never be active, right? Uh, so it's really a debate about the role of a judiciary uh, in a democratic society and the role of a judiciary uh, in a society uh, and in a constitution that has a constitution that purports uh, to guarantee to the states a republican form of government, right? So popular sovereignty and representative government and in a system that guarantees popular sovereignty and representative government, under what circumstances is it legitimate for uh, appointed individuals, or in some cases for one appointed individual, uh, to overturn the legislation that has been duly enacted? Duly enacted by people who have also taken an oath to faithfully uphold the Constitution. Um, we both agree that there's a role for judicial review, uh, and I think we both agree that substituting one's own policy judgments for uh, the law is always inappropriate. Um, that said, I think we also probably agree that the phrase freestanding activism by itself uh, is not very useful for many of the reasons that he just pointed out, right? Um, and in, in addition to Cass Sunstein's attempt to quantify it, more recently, uh, Corey Young has a piece in Northwestern Law Review that attempts to quantify judicial activism in terms of how frequently legislation is struck down. Um, now, another approach, though, uh, is to say that judges should only strike down legislation when it's unconstitutional beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, now, this is a position that was taken by uh, James Bradley Thayer, uh, and the reason that he took that position was because uh, if judges are too active in overturning democratically enacted legislation, then at some point legislators and presidents and governors uh, won't do their job. Uh, they won't faithfully uphold the Constitution because they know that if they overstep boundaries that the courts will step in. Um, and therefore, uh, you're, you're reducing the role uh, for democratically enacted legislators to do their job in interpreting uh, or at least applying faithfully the Constitution. I actually have uh, a lot more sympathy for that view uh, than Ilya. Uh, I believe uh, that, that said, I believe that sometimes courts do have a duty to strike down, strike down legislation even if reasonable people can disagree. And to me, uh, the dividing line is, or the question is, uh, when should courts invalidate statutes that reasonable people can disagree about the constitutionality of, and uh, when should courts not do that? When should courts have uh, a more active role, or a less active role? Um, now, there are the ambiguities that are in the Constitution uh, abound, right? I mean, you look at the word equal protection, uh, and trying to answer that question uh, just using text, uh, it's pretty difficult, right? Uh, does it include some sort of anti-subordination principle? Uh, does it include gender? On the face of it, it doesn't say it does, and it doesn't say it doesn't. Uh, or does it only apply to race? Does it apply to the disabled? Uh, does it only apply to laws that have a discriminatory purpose? Right? I mean, the language purpose does not appear uh, in the Equal Protection Clause, but it's been interpreted to mean that. Uh, does it apply to gender classifications? And if it does, uh, does it apply to gender restrictions in marriage laws? Um, so that's just one example. I mean, another example would be, you know, what does liberty mean? Uh, does it only encompass physical constraints? Uh, does it encompass state-created liberty interests? Uh, what about the freedom more broadly to be left alone? What does cruel mean? Who decides? Does it include the concept that punishment should be proportional to a crime? Uh, that is, would the death penalty be okay uh, for stealing a bar of chocolate? Does it include the concept of whom a state may punish? 
Uh, that is, would it be okay to give the death penalty to a seven-year-old? What does unusual mean, right? What's the denominator uh, when we're trying to decide what is unusual? Reasonable people can disagree about the meaning of these words. And to add another layer of complication, we have, of course, the Ninth Amendment, which says that just because a right is not enumerated in the Constitution uh, doesn't mean that that right doesn't exist, right? Which Ilya also pointed out. Now, to add another layer of complication, the Constitution tells us uh, about the scope of congressional action. And reasonable people, though, can disagree about those provisions, too. Right? It's not obvious on the face of the Interstate Commerce Clause what that means. Uh, does interstate commerce mean only when one state is engaging in uh, commerce with another state? Uh, that strikes me, use, look, using text alone, that strikes me as a plausible uh, interpretation. Uh, does it only apply to commercial activity that affects more national markets? Does it apply to activity uh, that affects national markets that's not commercial in nature but in its consequences is commercial, uh, even though the activity itself isn't commercial? What about the tax power? Uh, is it okay to attach tax consequences to certain conduct, uh, like buying a home uh, or being married or having kids or donating to a campaign uh, or donating to a charity, rather? Uh, or having health insurance. Section 5 of the 14th Amendment allows Congress to pass legislation, appropriate legislation is the language, uh, to enforce that provision. Uh, who decides what's appropriate? Right? Does the Constitution thereby vest in Congress the ability to decide what is appropriate? Uh, is it a political question to get into the muck of whether or not what Congress did uh, with respect to Section 5, or does with respect to Section 5, uh, is uh, valid or not valid or appropriate or inappropriate? Uh, and are judges actually getting involved in the legislative role when they try to decide whether Congress acted appropriately? Um, now, judges, by definition, therefore must apply judgment uh, in all of these types of cases and many others. In my view, in deciding how to apply that judgment, uh, the work of John Hart Ely uh, is very useful. Uh, because his view is uh, that the problem with always relying on the legislature to take care of constitutional problems uh, is that sometimes the legislature uh, doesn't reflect the will of society or uh, there's there the clogs, sorry, the channels of political change can be clogged in a number of ways, uh, or there may be people who don't have an equal voice in government, and there are two consequences of that fact uh, that, that that flow rather from that fact. The first uh, is that it is my view that constitutional provisions that are designed to protect equality of rights uh, and Constitutional provisions that are designed to clear the channels of political change should be applied to government action even when reasonable people can disagree about the constitutionality. Uh, in those situations, judges should be faithful to the text, the history, and precedent without respect to whether or not reasonable people can disagree. By contrast, our constitutional design gives considerable voice to the rights of states. Uh, it's inherent in the design of the Constitution. Uh, by this I mean, if you look to the Senate, right, uh, every state has an equal voice in the Senate. And for our founders, our founders believed that was very consequential. Uh, Madison put it this way. He said, you can't pass, no legislation can be passed first without the consent of the majority of the people, referring to the House, uh, and then with respect to uh, the majority of the states, and he was referring to uh, the Senate. Chief Justice Marshall actually said something very similar in McCulloch. Uh, he said uh, that the states are, quote, represented in the Senate, and their sovereignties are represented uh, in the Senate. As a result, I think that in situations that involve states' rights, if reasonable people can disagree about text, history, and precedent, uh, then courts should be more deferential 
to legislatures in that context. Second, I believe that the ultimate minority in any society is the individual. And as a result, actually Ilya and I agree on this point, uh, as a result, uh, constitutional provisions that are designed to protect individual liberty, including the first and the second and fourth and fifth, should be applied uh, rigorously, right, with attention to the text, history, and precedent, uh, regardless of whether reasonable people can disagree. Uh, one concern I have, however, uh, is that sometimes there are different mechanisms that courts have placed, uh, or different barriers, rather, that courts have placed in the role of litigants who are attempting to enforce their constitutional rights. And by restricting the remedies that are available to people who are seeking their constitutional rights, courts, therefore, uh, in effect, are also restricting the right itself. Right? So you know, Chief Justice Marshall also told us right, that uh, any right, for any right, there must be a remedy. Right? Uh, and Carl Llewellyn has said the same thing. Right? If you don't have a remedy, then you really don't have a right. You can call it a right all you want, but if there's no remedy, there is no right. Uh, and there are a number of moments that, uh, in my view, courts have unduly stepped in the way uh, of litigants. One would be the context of sovereign immunity. Right? So uh, the 11th Amendment says that the judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any uh, class of cases so in law or equity uh, between a citizen of one state uh, and another state or between a citizen uh, or subject of a foreign state and a state. Right? So that's the language of the 11th Amendment, the judicial power of the United States. Despite that language, and despite the fact that this provision begins, the judicial power of the United States, the Supreme Court has interpreted that language somehow to mean that, uh, well, to mean two very strange things. Number one, a citizen can't sue their own state, despite the very clear language of the 11th Amendment. Uh, and number two, Congress cannot pass legislation that allows people to sue states, even when that means that someone is suing a state in state court. Right? despite the language, ju the judicial power of the United States. And I don't think that there is any reasonable construction uh, of the 11th Amendment that would lead to that view. Uh, the only uh, way that you get there is to do what the court has actually been very candid about doing. Justice Scalia has said that the 11th Amendment stands not for what it says, uh, but for the broad presuppositions for which it stands. Uh, and in my view, that is problematic. Uh, another example... Uh, would be the role of uh, qualified immunity. There are a number of moments uh, where the court uh, has interpreted uh, qualified immunity in ways that just aren't uh, particularly tied to any type of constitutional provision. I mean, the words qualified immunity themselves appear nowhere in the Constitution. Uh, another example would be what are called Bivens suits. So people are allowed to sue federal actors uh, for different constitutional violations. Uh, but in recent years, courts have been increasingly stingy about when they will allow different Bivens remedies. Uh, so there's a case called Arar from the Second Circuit that came out last year that strongly implies uh, that you don't have a remedy uh, against a federal actor who violates different substantive due process rights. Uh, and the court went out of its way in Iqbal uh, to say that they've never said that you have a Bivens right for a First Amendment violation, suggesting that that's now uh, potentially on the chopping block as well. Uh, and that's concerning, right? Because again, uh, there is no right if there is no remedy. Another example would be standing. Sure, the Constitution says that you have to have a case or controversy. Uh, but the court has gone uh, very, very much further than that language uh, in order in, to decide what constitutes a case or controversy before someone uh, may be able to uh, come into court. And I'm happy to say more about that, um, but I don't want to go over my time. Uh, and so with that, I mean, I guess just again, my, my, basic, my basic point is that in a democratic society, uh, there should be deference that is given to legislators uh, because we should trust that they take their responsibility seriously uh, 
to uphold the Constitution. Uh, and therefore, when reasonable people can disagree, the background principle should be when reasonable people disagree about uh, constitutional text or history, uh, then deference should go to the legislature. However, uh, when you are dealing with a constitutional provision that is intended to clear the channels of political change uh, or protect individual liberty, such as the Bill of Rights, uh, that's a very different circumstance. And their court should faithfully apply the text, the history, and precedent without respect to whether reasonable people disagree. Uh, and I don't think the court has done that in the context of sovereign immunity uh, or in Bivens cases, and in some instances in the case of qualified immunity. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for those remarks. Um, kind of a, a broad, uh, high-level conversation we're having here, and I find myself agreeing with uh, most uh, of what Professor Smith has said, uh, particularly with the examples of sovereign immunity and qualified immunity, Bivens. Standing, um, I think the court's pretty good, except for the Establishment Clause issues, but that's because its own Establishment Clause jurisprudence is a complete muddle. Um, but if you kind of read between the lines of what he's saying and what I said, you do tease out one huge difference, and that is the presumption, okay? Um, Professor Smith mentioned such things as, you know, when reasonable people disagree. Well, you know, when that happens, whoever bears the burden of, of, of persuasion or, or evidence or proof or, or what have you, um, uh, uh, loses because they haven't they haven't borne that uh, that that burden. Whoever's challenging uh, loses. Um, I think that there should be a thumb on the scales of liberty at all times, and uh, I guess I'm for less deference by the courts than Professor Smith has uh, uh, less deference by the courts for the legislature than, than Professor Smith does. Um, uh, and, and that is because even though uh, legislators have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. And that's perhaps one thing, the, the, the only thing I agree with Christine O'Donnell on. I, I do think that congressmen and senators do need to consider the constitutionality of any legislation that's uh, presented to them. I probably agree with her that she's not a witch either, although I really don't have enough information to make a full uh, determination. Um, but look, this does go to the role of a judiciary in a, in a free and democratic society and in this what does a republican system of government mean. Um, there's one other key thing that I don't know if you picked up on. Uh, Professor Smith seems to apply a different presumption on uh, liberty provisions of the Constitution versus the rest, you know, meaning, I guess, the power or the structural provisions of the Constitution. That is a false dichotomy. Our Constitution is a holistic document. The entire thing, even before the Bill of Rights uh, was added, is created to promote individual liberty. Um, the powers and rights side are two sides uh, of the same coin. Remember the, the, the debate about whether even to have a Bill of Rights. Why do we need this? We don't have, we don't, we don't give government any powers to violate our rights. Furthermore, if you enumerate the rights, that'll, you know, uh, disparage all these other ones. We can't enumerate every single right. Look, I have a right to wear a hat that's uh, red. I have a right to wear not, not to wear a hat. You know, all the, I have the right to get out of bed on the right side, on the left side. I mean, we can't just enumerate all these things. Okay, so we'll have the Ninth Amendment to you know, do that. And to underline that we're not giving the states any more powers, we'll have, or the federal government any more powers, we'll have uh, the Tenth Amendment. Um, you know, it's, it, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment taken together is pretty much the Constitution in a microcosm. We have a sea of liberty with islands of governmental authority to, you know, kind of keep the rules of the game in check. For example, the Commerce Clause. Okay, Professor Smith said that that was kind of nebulous or, uh, you know, might change or, or, or what have you. Um, the regulation of interstate commerce uh, at the time of the founding of the ratification of, of the Constitution means to make regular commerce, okay, uh, between, that goes between states. Commerce doesn't mean manufacturing or trade or anything with a dollar sign attached to it, as we now uh, think of it in that context. It means trade in goods. The interstate trade in goods to make that regular. This was uh, an anti-protectionism measure to prevent states from uh, levying tariffs against each other and other trade barriers, as kept happening under the Articles of Confederation and prevented us from having a more perfect union, as it were. 
Um, you know, it, what we now conceive of as the Dormant Commerce Clause was really, you know, if you read the ratification debates, what that provision was all about. You know, it wasn't uh, a sword so much for the federal government to go and, um, you know, uh, in, intrude on all areas of our life uh, where we now have to debate, you know, what, does this local economic activity have a substantial enough effect in the aggregate on interstate commerce if it's part of a comprehensive scheme and kind of, you know, how many angels dance on the head of that pin. Um, it's, it's, it was a shield to protect, you know, to promote liberty, to promote trade and commerce and, and, and these sorts of things. Um, go back to political theory 101, okay? We all have our own 100% individual sovereignty of which we delegate certain bits to the government to protect our rights against murderers, you know, national defense, sometimes public goods, these sorts of things. We delegate temporarily, enumerate these limited powers that we give to that other sovereign, to the government. Okay? Um, we retain all other powers. We have all of our full natural rights. Um, uh, and so uh, to limit government power is to enhance our liberty. Uh, it's not a matter of presuming that everything that government does is constitutional. Well, no, Congress could have been uh, uh, wrong in its assessment of its own powers. We don't let Congress assess its own powers, even if it disagrees. Um, you know, reasonable people disagree. The judge has to throw up his hands. No. The judge is paid to figure out, to make those hard calls about whether the Constitution permits the government to do that uh, or not. Um, you know, the main liberty-protecting provisions of the Constitution, as understood in either 1789, 91, 1868, with the ratification of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, uh, was not the Bill of Rights. It was the structural provisions uh, of the Constitution. And so, um, uh, you know, the... the Having this thumb on the scales, presuming that anything that Congress does, as long as it might be reasonable, um, is, uh, is going too far. It, it gives too much power uh, to legislators, and it, and it gives judges too much power. You know, they play this game of bifurcating our rights that started with Caroline Products footnote four. You know, is this right fundamental? If it is, well, then government can't do what it's doing. If it's not fundamental, then... Uh, a government can do what it's doing. I mean, it's, 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 it's not a principled uh, way of judicial interpretation, and that's uh, what the root of all of our, a lot of our um, disputes are. Uh, two things. Uh, so first, with respect to standing. Uh, in particular, what bothers me about current standing uh, doctrine is that in order for, so if a litigant's constitutional rights have been violated, okay? Um, and it's not compensable with damages for whatever every reason. Maybe because uh, they can't show that it violated clearly established law, uh, which is something you have to show under qualified immunity. And that person wants to seek an injunction from a court to say, I don't want this to happen to me again. I want you to stop this practice that violates uh, my constitutional rights and other people's constitutional rights. That litigant not only has to show that their constitutional rights have been violated before, they also have to show that their constitutional rights are likely to be violated again, right? Uh, and that's been read into standing and mootness. Mootness is kind of at that intersection. Uh, and so that's what I was referring to when I referred to, to standing doctrine that I think is kind of at some point divorced from the Constitution and ends up restricting constitutional rights. Um, but we do have a disagreement. Uh, we have a disagreement about uh, what the institutional role of judges are and what judges' competitive or comparative advantage uh, is. I happen to think that legislators have a role uh, in uh, applying to the Constitution faithfully. Uh, and I believe that uh, if courts go too far, then legislators will not take that responsibility uh, nearly as seriously as they should. And I think the reason why legislators do not take the responsibility nearly, uh, take that responsibility uh, as seriously, seriously as they should is because they think that, well, if we go too far, then a court will step in. Um, I just think that the language regulating interstate commerce, uh, that judges, uh, and I'm a, I, I teach law school, I love law schools, <laughs> But I don't think that judges are inherently better. I don't think there's something inherent in the role of being a judge uh, that makes them necessarily better uh, at deciding what interstate commerce is than someone who's been elected to faithfully uphold the Constitution. I just don't. Uh, and that's why 
I believe in the background principle that when reasonable people can disagree, that we should defer to legislatures uh, on uh, a number of questions, and again, most notably states' rights. Uh, so what, what, um, what's the, you know, so, what, so how did, and I have a reason for my dividing line, right? My dividing line between when we should uh, have that deference and when we shouldn't, shouldn't is, is clear, right? Uh, we want legislators to reflect the public will, uh, but there are circumstances when legislation may not reflect the public will, most notably when the channels of political change are blocked, right? So if you have uh, a poll tax, right, or uh, if you have separate schools uh, that relegate uh, one segment of society uh, to, a, to a place where they're, they're ultimately not able to express their voice, um, when the channels of political change are blocked, right, when groups of people are subjugated uh, in our system such that uh, it can hardly be called uh, a Republican form of government, uh, which happened throughout much uh, of our history, uh, then those are the circumstances where I think that even if reasonable people should, can disagree, uh, we should apply the text, the history, and the precedent without respect to that. Thanks. I don't have the questions. So anybody, yeah. Well, it, it, to a large extent, it's a, it's a red herring. And I haven't heard anyone say that, I mean, maybe occasionally, but that you know, judges should um, just put in their own policy preferences. I mean, that, that, that is kind of a, um, a, a straw man. Um, the, the problem comes in uh, where, um, you know, for example, at, at Elena Kagan's confirmation hearing, this is the best line of questioning by, by Tom Colbert, who's not a senator from Oklahoma, who's not a lawyer. And maybe, the, maybe what we should do to make these hearings more relevant is to kick off all the lawyers and have others do the question. But anyway, yes, uh, would it be constitutional for Congress to uh, pass a law requiring you to uh, have three servings of fruits and vegetables every day? I mean, and, you know, she said, oh, that's a ridiculous law. I would never vote for it. That's stupid. You know, but she never said it was unconstitutional. That seems to be an easy question. You know, and I don't think she was, you know, playing political games or, you know, you know I might have to decide that at some point, uh, you know, or whatever. I mean, she did. But it, it's, you know, if you take the Constitution seriously, there is just no way that that law can be uh, constitutional. And yet, I've had debates uh, in the context of the individual mandate, because obviously that's what the subtext of this is, uh, where my interlocutors, you know, I actually got them to concede that, yeah, well, that would be constitutional. If, if something like that is constitutional, then the Constitution has no meaning. And so, you know, that perhaps is not substituting um, the judge's own policy views, but it's substituting the views of, uh, the view of a constitution that you know, doesn't mean what it says. Um, uh, as the, the Florida judge two weeks ago in rejecting the government's motion to dismiss said, it's an Alice in Wonderland uh, conception of, of words. So it's, I don't know if it's, you know, particularly substituting policy views, but it's, substituting a view of the relationship of the, of, of the government to the people and the constitution to the, to the government um, uh, that uh, is one's own. Um, how widespread of a problem is it? I'm not sure how widespread it is, but it certainly happens. I, I'll, I'll give you one sort of weird example. Um, so in Heller, right, so I, I believe in the individual right to bear arms. Um, but in Heller, the court didn't say that you have, didn't just say you have an individual right to bear arms. They said you have an individual right to bear arms in the home. Right? Now, if you look at the text of the Second Amendment, uh, home appears nowhere therein. Uh, maybe you could make a textual argument that uh, because the Third Amendment uh, protects the right not to have soldiers in the home, or that the Fourth Amendment protects the home, that maybe there's a broader constitutional value of the home, I don't know. But, uh, so the for, right, <laughs> you can make a kind of penumbrous type of argument about it. Um, but, you know, in the tradition of Griswold on the right to privacy, uh, but I, I don't think that 
uh, just as Scalia would be comfortable saying that that's what he was doing. Uh, but either he was doing that, uh, which is one mode of constitutional interpretation, uh, or he was just he was using, he was exercising judgment uh, as a judge uh, to say, well, this doesn't mean just as a I'm using my own judgment. This does not mean that people should have the right to have uh, guns in schools or in courthouses or you know, I mean so. So there, I mean, he was exercising a policy judgment, in my view. Um, to the extent that it's a problem, I, I think, again, where I, have a, there, where I have a serious problem with it, though, is, that, again, when it comes res with respect to restricting remedies uh, such that people can't vindicate their rights. Uh, and to me, sovereign immunity uh, is just a, a very solid example of that. Qualified immunity uh, is also an example. That, where the court, I mean, you just you read qualified immunity opinions that are that purport to be interpreting Section 1983. Section 1983 is the law that allows people to go into court and vindicate uh, their constitutional rights against state actors. Uh, and how they get qualified immunity, I mean, it's, it's policy. I mean, and they acknowledge that it's policy. Right? We're going to balance the following policy goals. Um, and uh, and that, that strikes me as problematic. Another moment that I think we saw it, uh, it's not quite in the constitutional context, but it does uh, play a role in vindicating constitutional rights is in Iqbal uh, and interpreting Rule 8A2. Uh, rule 8A2 says that you have to have a plain statement of uh, the factual legal basis for your claim. Uh, and the court somehow read into that uh, very high uh, plausibility standard, right? Such that, and, and, the, and the court actually said, that in deciding what's plausible, judges should exercise their own wisdom. I mean, the word wisdom actually appears in the opinion to decide in interpreting Rule 882. And it just, it's, that to me is a policy judgment, uh, and it's a policy judgment that results in the restriction of individual rights, including individual constitutional rights. Uh, so those are examples where I do think it's probably. Well, there's, there's a difference between, I mean, that's not a constitutional decision, that's, that's the better rule of Civil so procedure, which can be amended, and you know, Arnold Specter has, has said that he, well, I guess he's going to be gone soon anyway, but uh, that wants to amend pleading standards and, and, and things like this. Uh, I, I'm all for suing government actors, so I, I guess I mostly agree with you on some of those things. Um, uh, what was I going to say that jumped into my mind? Oh, I'm still somehow feel more inhibited, you know, they don't, um, they somehow, yeah, in inhibit their lawmaking role. Is there any indication that's been happening? Because I feel like you might almost have the opposite result, where legislators say, well, there's no consistent line, you know, of thought coming from the Supreme Court or, or from the uh, judiciary, so we're just going to do what we feel like and say, you know, there's no real control. Or, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's any evidence of that actually happening. Yeah, I think it's difficult you know, because I think that courts have been active long enough that it's hard to know. I mean, it's, it's sort of one of those questions that uh, it's hard to have empirical evidence for it um, because the, because courts have been active so long, it's hard to know how uh, court how Congress would react uh, if they had to take their their role to the, of applying the Constitution faithfully. I guess my view, though, is that in a democratic society. Um, why, why should there be that level of distrust in the people who folks have sent uh, to express their will? Like, why should there be uh, that, that level of distrust in their ability to, uh, to make laws uh, in accordance with the Constitution? Uh, it's just, it's not obvious to me. Uh, and it's not obvious to me that that judges are just you know they're way better better at that. I just I think that judges uh, can sometimes succumb to the will of su supplanting their own policy views uh, for the law. Yeah. They should have that suspicion because uh, it's the government that has the force of a gun behind it, um, and we have a long tradition of um, of that sort of, of skepticism. I mean, under uh, again, go back to political theory 101. Where does the government get its legitimacy? You know, it's not consent. It's not even implied consent. It's you know because it maximally guarantees the rights of minority interests. That's kind of um, 
it's, it's an imperfect, but it's the best way that we can justify um, the government having any sort of power, um, and, you know, given that it's, it's humans, governing humans. Um, and uh, Professor Smith has put his finger on, on a very important issue. Legislators really don't consider the constitutionality of things. They just pass the buck, or they just don't care. Or, you know, when Nancy Pelosi was asked, you know, what, what do you think about the constitutional claims that are being raised about Obamacare? And she said, are you serious? Because, of course, it's the last refuge of the scoundrel who doesn't have any policy arguments to bring up that musty old constitution under glass, right? You read the congressional debates and the congressional record in the 19th century, and it's all about, do we have the power under the Constitution to do this? Uh, in, in, in 1887, I have notes of this because it's such a salient example, Grover Cleveland vetoed an appropriation of $10,000 for seeds to Texas farmers who had suffered terrible drought, saying, I can find no warrant for such appropriation in the Constitution. 20 years later, talking about a court now, the Supreme Court in the case of Kansas versus Colorado, the court said the proposition that there are legislative powers affecting the nation as a whole, although not expressed in a specific grant of powers, is in direct conflict with the doctrine that this is a government of enumerated powers. Okay, people took this idea seriously at one point. Contrast that with the New Deal, okay, when there were discussions uh, in the administration uh, and in the uh, Roosevelt Justice Department about whether to push certain piece of legislation through, even though there are constitutional qualms, or seek a constitutional amendment. Um, uh, Rexford Tugwell, great name, former Columbia professor, one of the architects of the New Deal, has this great quote that says, to the extent that these New Deal policies developed, they were torture interpretations of a document intended to prevent them. I mean, they knew what they were doing. They were like letters from Roosevelt to uh, a Senate and congressional leaders saying, don't let constitutional qualms get in the way of your passing this needed legislation. I mean, if it was so needed and so popular, you know, uh, unemployment insurance, uh, widows and, and orphans benefits at the depths of the Great Depression, if that was, you know, urgent, pass a constitutional amendment. And if even under those circumstances, uh, you couldn't pass a constitutional amendment, well, that should mean something about that skepticism that people have uh, about the government. So that's really where we went off the rails and why uh, legislators, legislators don't consider uh, the constitutionality. I think Mr. Shapiro just provided the best empirical evidence that I've heard uh, for my point, right? So uh, you've said that in the 19th century, legislators used to take their responsibility seriously to the Constitution, uh, and other elected officials like the president, President Cleveland, took his responsibility to the Constitution seriously. Uh, we have the late 19th century, you have James uh, Bradley Thayer, uh, who says that uh, there's a role for, legis for legislative officials uh, to apply the Constitution faithfully. Then we have Lochner, right, uh, in, uh, around, in the early 1900s, uh, which was far more aggressive uh, with respect to when, uh, what Congress uh, or any legislator could or couldn't do, right? So they, they read a very aggressive uh, economic liberty principle into uh, the, you know, the substantive due process clause, essentially. Uh, and began striking down legislation uh, with a little bit less care. Uh, and then we learn uh, that by the time we got to the 1930s, legislators believed that courts would take care of it, right? I mean, FDR tried to pack the court, right? Uh, so actually, I think that, so you asked for empirical evidence, uh, and I think Mr. Shapiro just gave you something. Time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, this is a old question, but you uh, I should throw this in the comment uh, about the issue of why people are taking, or why politicians are taking this uh, into the Constitution less seriously. I would say that uh, you don't get reelected on the idea that you upheld the Constitution. You get reelected on the idea that you Until didn't. this cycle, perhaps. True, true. But you kind of see that in democracies throughout the world. Or part of you don't get reelected, you're just saying, I upheld the Constitution. But regardless, a uh, question, what for each of you? Um, hopefully, quick answers. Uh, for you, uh, I was wondering when you were speaking. Uh, I generally agree with a lot of the things you're saying, but I was wondering when you would say that a judge should rule an issue non-justiciable, i.e. they just don't have the means of making a decision, or making a decision would really be disrespectful to other branches of government. Um, when does putting the finger on the scales towards liberty go farther than that? I'll give you an example. The global warming uh, litigation that's ongoing right now 
Um, lawsuits all over the place. There's a case out of the Second Circuit, a case out of the Fifth, a case out of the Ninth. Um, the theory being that utilities, energy companies uh, emit greenhouse gases which exacerbate uh, weather patterns, uh, eventually cause property damage or you know, other things that greenhouse gases cause and, and, and things like this, climate change uh, and whatever else. Um, the EPA is in the process of regulating these things, the political process in Congress, they're you know, discussing cap and trade or something else, or you know, the, the, the process is working. Um, or you know, it's, it's happening, there, there, there are actions being taken by the executive and legislative branches. For the judicial branch, on a theory of uh, state tort of causation, or of a, of a, a, a causation theory of, uh, of nuisance or um, you know, kind of public nuisance, these sorts of things, the way into that, uh, I think, would be taking uh, uh, judicial imperialism, as I said, sort of trying to take kind of a legislative role or an executive role in terms of promulgating regulations. Uh, so that is uh, an example of, of, of something, I think, that is um, a place where the political question doctrine does have a place where the court should abstain. I'm, re I'm relatively comfortable with kind of political question doctrine. So if the Constitution vests discretion uh, in a branch or in a particular person, uh, then I think courts should back off. Uh, and But that said, I might interpret it a little bit differently than some people, because I, I think that when, in Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, uh, if it were appropriate, uh, that, that there should be more deference to Congress than uh, is, is currently given with respect to Congress deciding what is appropriate. But again, again, uh, Baker v. Carr and it's in the United States. Plug that test in to my view. The, they match up very well. My question to you kind of on the same note, but just applying it to your uh, philosophy where you generally um, use the term legislator when reasonable people can disagree. Um, my question on that was that basically any time there's any controversy using people disagreeing, you know, uh, reasonable disagreement happens on every issue, um, regardless of the fact that obviously you would probably say that the judiciary maybe shouldn't um, just cede its authority to the legislative branch. So for example, for Monsi, uh, the great example, reasonable people disagreed about whether the executive had the authority to do that. As a matter of fact, six out of the nine justices said that the executive authority did have the ability to do that. But in retrospect, in almost unanimous solution, people would say that was the wrong choice. It really wasn't about deference at that point. It was just getting it right. And that was inherently wrong. So when should, when should reasonable people disagree not be enough? Right. Again, uh, so I, I would I encourage you to look at John Hart Ely's Democracy and Mistrust, uh, which I think lays out in very, very well when we should be when we should be distrustful. So I don't think there should be a background of distrust, but I think there are circumstances where we should be distrustful. Uh, and you, so you just pointed to an, an example where you have you know, the subjugation of a minority group who doesn't have a political voice. Uh, they don't have the means to effectuate their will through the political process. Uh, and those are the circumstances where I think courts should be more active uh, by the text, history, and precedent without respect to what the reason we want to I don't think courts should be more or less uh, deferential in a particular case. They should just do their role. I mean, judges effectively have judicial review, Marjorie you know, Mass all the way down, is de novo review for constitutionality, not for policy wisdom or anything else, but for constitutionality of the legislatures or the presidents or both uh, action. Um, and, and, and that's it, you know. Yeah, there's political question doctrine, in which case they exercise their general review and they say, oh, there's no real constitutional question there at all. It's a policy question, I defer. Or I abstain, rather. Right? It's not defer, I abstain. Uh, but it's not, well, the, they're, they're pretty much in equipoise, these issues, so I'll defer. Never should that be the, uh, the outcome. I'd like to thank our participants.